Well, hello, hello, and welcome to another Discover Headless Tech interview from headlesscreator.com. I am Marcelo Lewin, the Headless Creator. As always, you can get a hold of me right there, Marcelo at headlesscreator.com. Today's conversation is all about headless dis digital asset management systems. Uh, we're going to be talking about dams and the difference between a dam and a digital and a headless one uh, and the relationship with a headless CMS. Uh, my guest is Max Mabe. He's the director of marketing at Cloudinary. But before we get started, you know how this works. I'm going to tell you real quick about headlesscreator.com and why you need to go get an account. Well, you know why you need to get an account because you want the on-demand version of this episode, which will be available right after we're done. But you also want all the other stuff we offer, and we offer a lot of content for you. Content Modeling Weekly, Discover, Headless Tech, Composable Commerce, Uniform Weekly Tips, bunch of focus on um, headless CMS courses, a bunch of bootcamp courses. And look, we even have a headless uh, dam course with Cloudinary that's, that's uh, starting uh, real soon, actually. So go get your free account. You won't regret it. You'll love it. And uh, all right, that's it. Now, uh, for those of you watching live, if you have any questions for Max, go ahead and type it in your chat because I'll go ahead and ask. But with that said, Max, welcome. Hello, how are you? I'm doing great. Glad to have you here. Good to be here. Now, where are you located? I am located, well, I spend most of my time in LA, and then I also uh, spend time in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Oh, okay. So you go back and forth. Yeah, I'm in LA. So we had a little conversation about uh, LA versus Santa Fe and and the weather. And you guys have so much nicer weather than we're going to have today here with 105 Maybe degrees. Yeah, yeah I don't know how, how much that is in Celsius, because I know we have a European audience, but I think it's in the high 30s, which is really bad. Um, so anyway, um, so hey, let's uh, let's jump in and let's talk about digital asset management systems. Uh, before we do that, give us a little bit of your background. Sure. Well, let's see. I, I've been in technology my whole career. Um, I started out as a systems integrator and uh, solutions architect for many years working in North and South America. Uh, primarily, it was all around digital asset management, so helping companies that were really small, helping fine artists, helping very large companies, very large retailers, government agencies, even did a bombing range uh, thing in Utah once, oh, helping wow. them kind of, you know, get their digital asset management uh, information right. going. Uh, I've done product management for Apple and Adobe. Uh, and I've done marketing uh, at Adobe for Adobe Experience Manager in their digital asset management solution, which is called AEM Assets. Uh, right. And I made my way recently to Cloudinary. I've been with Cloudinary for about a year and a half, mm -hmm. where I help them with a lot of strategy pieces and primarily focus on marketing their uh, digital asset management solution. So yeah. you said you manage North and South America. Do you speak Spanish? Very little. Enough Un to poquito. order. Un poquito. Yeah. Oh, okay, now because I speak Spanish, I was wondering we, we could switch into Spanish here and just you know we we'll have subtitles later. We could, we could do a little, see how far we can take it. Un poco, un poco. <laughs> Very small amount. Very small. <laughs> um, so it seems like you've been with uh, dams, uh, digital asset management systems, quite a bit. I mean, what attracted you to that? Why? Why is that? Did you well, it was, it was interesting. Focus? You know, I. I I've always been kind of a creative person, and I actually have a, a BFA degree in fine art and photography. Oh. Um, oh, cool! And right out of out of that, I got into managing a digital photography studio back in New York City, and, and we had tons and tons of assets that we were taking for customers like Martha Stewart and and, and Bloomingdale's and very large retailers. And I really kind of fell into that idea. Well, how are we going to manage this workflow? from taking the images to editing the images and getting them ready and getting them out to customers. That whole workflow to me became very, very interesting. So mm -hmm. I started to get more into the technical aspects of managing that workflow. So that was kind of where I fell into the world of digital asset management and workflows and kind of understanding what's needed both on kind of the creative front and what's also needed on the back end logistically to get all of those there's thousands of images and items from the beginning to the end and right. then out to customers. And so that's kind of where my career started and, and kind of fell into the technical part. Yeah. yeah. 
It's interesting you said photography, right? Because for, for those watching that may not be familiar with digital asset management systems, but they maybe do photography and they're working in Lightroom or whatever, that's almost like a little mini dam, right? To manage. It is. I, I mean, and it's a very interesting uh, point that you make. There are often times where people are using applications that are in essence a dam, yeah. but they're not really aware that they're using digital asset management. Right. Certainly Lightroom is, is used pretty much by all photographers, right? And they understand right. the idea of metadata and sorting and tuning um, imagery and items within that. Um, it just perhaps is not as robust as it might be when you start adding in a larger work group of people as far mm -hmm. as collaboration and sharing is concerned. Right, right. Most of the basics are certainly there in Lightroom that you would want to think about or be attracted to having that feature set and down. Right. But, but the cool part is they already understand the basics of a dam, right? Because they're working with something that they have no clue is actually exactly. a dam. Exactly. So, so let's, let's start with that. Let's define sure. a dam for those that aren't, um, familiar with it and no, we're not using any bad words. It's okay to use the word dam here. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you can answer this question in a lot of ways, right? I mean, there are different types of digital asset management. As we just mentioned, it can be as simple as just following folder structure, right? Where you're kind of moving things into the right folder. Maybe you're thinking of a naming convention for files uh, on a very basic level. That is management of digital assets. When we talked about Lightroom, there's a few more bells and whistles. Maybe there's some more metadata features that you can set up, uh, allows you to work a little bit more efficiently. There are enterprise sync and share services like, for example, Dropbox or Box or Google Drive or mm -hmm. SharePoint, which we're all kind of familiar with, which in a way is digital asset management too. There are some pluses to it. Those systems are fairly easy to share, but when you start adding five, 10 or 20 users to those kinds of environments, they become unwieldy, right? Mm -hmm. When we talk about official dam solutions, and there are many providers, I think the, the dam market and the dam software has been around for probably around 25 years, or perhaps a little bit more. So this is kind of a, a solution that's been around for a while. Um, and there are a lot of different vendors. When we think of digital asset management, it is kind of a complete package. And that means that you're able to store content and assets you're able to very easily search and find. You're able to tag assets with metadata or keywords or other information to help you search and find and, and, and publish your assets. And typically all of the dams have some way for you to share and collaborate both internally and externally. Now, that being said, there are different types of dams. Some dam providers are focused on what we might call work groups or working with smaller um sized companies or teams there are some um dams like adobe experience manager open text or binder which are really concerned with very large enterprise organizations that are worldwide so you're talking about thousands of users or potentially um, hundreds of brand portals or websites that will allow various vendors and partners to either upload or download of brand related content. So there's there's kind of a really big um, scope of different types of digital asset management solutions. Uh, and, and you know when you're looking for something for you or your organization, I think that you, know, you want to find something that's the right fit for what you're trying to right, do. Right. Yeah. Now you mentioned assets, but let's because for people when they say ass when they hear assets they go oh it's a image a graphic or mm -hmm. but assets could be many things right so let's define assets and let's give some example of uh, assets and for example the difference between a production asset when you're working with something and a delivery asset when you're delivering it to a channel yeah so I think for this audience it may be to set the foundation it may be interesting to talk a little bit about the term content, right? When we yeah. think CMS systems, we typically think about managing content. That content could be an image, it could be a video, but primarily when we talk about content, it could be a widget for an experience on a page. It could be some uh, text strings or values. You know, you're, you're working with content. In, in the dam world, we don't really use the term content, right? You're correct. We, we use the term asset or assets, sometimes people will call them items, right? How many items are in your asset catalog? How many assets do you have in your town? 
and they can be anything. It can be an image, it can be a video, it could be a PowerPoint presentation, a PDF, any digital file, even content streams could live in the dam depending upon how you set up the dam to work. Mm -hmm. um, that could also include 3D models and textures and materials, right? So the sky is really the limit as far as assets are concerned. The question about production is, is one of those questions or production files versus ready to use files for web experiences. It kind of depends on your, um, your business, right? And how you set up your workflow. There are some organizations that, that say, hey, you know, we've shot everything in camera raw or we've created graphics or files that are multi-layered PDS files. And we want to keep all of those in the town. So we have them for historical uh, reasons. And if we ever need to go back and get another version or we, we don't want to, we want to have kind of that pristine original archive file, they will keep those in the dam, right? Uh, and then they will create variations of those in, in JPEGs or MP4 files for video or whatever is required for those consumable smaller versions uh, for web use or application use. Um, there's really no difference as to how those files are, are kind of treat, treated in the database uh, or the catalog or the dam. You know, uh, you'll still get a preview in most. Uh, you'll be able to apply metadata to those and use them like any other file. Some people will store them in another area, so they may have a section of the digital asset management solution or folder or a completely different database or catalog where they keep all the original archive files and then all of their sized versions are kept in their production catalog. That way they just don't get them deleted or destroyed or, or changed in the past. So does that answer your question? Of production? It does. It, it does answer. Uh, and just to clarify on the production assets, right, though, the mm -hmm. ones that people would work on, they're stored in the dam, but then when they're working on it, they still have to download it and put it locally, right? Because they're not working directly off of the dam. Well, yes and no, right? The workflow typically is you will keep your your kind of source asset or your full size asset, let's say a Photoshop or a TIFF image or camera raw image in the right. dam. You will kind of mark it in your production that it needs to be edited. That graphic designer or photographer will pull that down. Typically they'll use an image editing application and there are lots of them out there. We know Adobe does the Creative Cloud tools. They'll do their work on it and they will upload it back into the system. Some dams you know, have the added option of having a connector to the Creative Cloud suite. So you've got a little palette. So you kind of check out the image, you do the editing that's required and you check it back in and then it's in the dam. Right. Many dams will allow, allow you to see versions as well, right? So you'll see that original and you'll see the version that was created based upon the job spec or the need of that. Uh, so you're correct. On the other hand, there are some digital asset management solutions that offer some level of image editing and tuning within the solution. Uh, some of those do it only on delivery. So unless you're kind of a technical person and a developer, you can't really change the quality or size in the UI or the user interface of the dam. Uh, like our dam at Cloudinary, and there are a few others, we do allow you to actually take an image or a video as kind of a non-technical user or someone who is perhaps not proficient in coding, or let's say you don't have an act, a license to Photoshop, for example, you can do a lot of the editing yourself uh, in a WYSIWYG editor in the solution and create what we call asset variations uh, or different sizes or things that you may need for your partners or for websites or to use in the CMS or perhaps- Different channels. Yeah, different channels or populate the pen, right? So there are uh, several vendors that have now started to up-level their image editing abilities within the jam to kind of empower and allow non-technical users to work more quickly. So again, probably for 90% of people that are using digital asset management, they are taking it out, editing it in another application, putting it back in, letting someone else know it's ready. Right. Uh, there are some people that are saying, hey, I can self-serve. I've got the tools in the dam myself right. to grab that image, I'm empowered to do it, I can do it quickly, and then get that out to the channel or to the social media piece as well. Um, probably a little bit more of a modern way to work, and people are still 
starting to discover that these abilities are available in digital lesson. Well, I could see the the image editing, editing capabilities as very, very important because then you're empowering, let's say, a marketing team that doesn't have to go back to the graphic designer and say, hey, I need you know, a 16 by nine and I need a four by three of this picture and I wanna crop the face here, don't crop it there. They could just do that themselves, right? And we're gonna talk about image transformation as well because that's when we get into a little bit more of the headless where you can do that through program, uh, programmatically. Yeah, and but I would it say- it seems like that's an important yeah, feature. Yeah, and I would say one of the most important kind of wins around that is that as a creative or a graphic artist, you know, you probably don't want to spend your whole day in sizing, sizing, cropping, yeah, right. cropping sizing, sizing, cropping, cropping. It's fine. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's quite tedious. And, and we'd love to free those creatives up to be able to work on more creative, more important projects that will allow them to kind of drive the brand forward or drive the product offering forward. And then kind of, you know, with AI and, and automation, be able to streamline the, those kind of sizing pieces. Um, so so I, that I think is one of the big payoffs is that you're freeing up that creative staff to yeah. work on, on other pieces. Let's talk a little bit about an important thing that I consider to be important. Mm -hmm. And this is both in, in headless CMSs as well, which is single source of truth, yeah. right? So how is single source of truth supported in a DAM? And we mean like you have one image and that image can go to a billion places, but now you change that image. For example, the logo color changes. Yeah. You don't want to go to a billion different versions of this and change it everywhere, right? You want it to sort of be automatic. Um, is that something that's that's uh, 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 available in uh, uh, um, digital asset management systems? It is. You know, SQL Source of Truth has been an idea or concept that's been out a long time in digital asset management. And there, there's kind of two ways to think about it. One way is that you've got kind of the source asset, which is your original, and every version that you're going to create, it comes from that single source of truth. And that, that source asset has all of the correct metadata, everything that you need to know about rights management, about keywording, who's working on it. That, that's kind of your, your North Star, right? And that doesn't change, right? Uh, and it is kind of your archival file as well. That's one way to do it. In that aspect, you're still creating all of the sizes manually that might be needed to drive the business um, that you're supporting with your town. For example, let's say I'm a retailer and I have a picture of a dress, right? I know that I may need for that dress a social media, an Instagram, a header, a footer for my website. Maybe I need a category page thumbnail. Maybe I need a front, a back, a side, a swatch. At the end of the day, for that one image of the dress, you may have 15 to 20 images that are required in order to market that properly, right? So again, that master image will be taken into Photoshop. All of those will be created. And then all those sizes are loaded up to the dam. So you still have single source of truth. But it's kind of a different variation where you still have the original, but you have all of your variations that you're also managing in the catalog. Yeah. Not really ideal. A lot of organizations still work in this way. So one image becomes 21 images and you're really managing a lot. Imagine you've got a thousand items for sale times 20. That's a lot of assets to manage. That's one way that people are, are, are thinking about single source of truth. When we think about modern dams or dams that have some image automation and delivery capabilities and some transformation capabilities, single source of truth kind of takes on a different meaning. It means that you keep that one master file. It still has all the metadata associated with it, all the data. It's kind of locked, it's ready, but you are creating all of those sizes that are needed for that dress, the crops, the different versions for header for footer automatically at the time of delivery based upon the coding and the set transformations that you have, right? So you're not storing and managing those 20 times a thousand images. You're only storing the one single asset and you're doing all that intelligently at the time of delivery, right? And again, if you need to get a one-off where a vendor wants just the swatch or a certain crop, you can download that and send it to them.
or you can create a link in order to get it to them. So kind of two different concepts, kind of the, the, the legacy way of thinking about single source of truth where you're managing the original plus all the uh, asset variations in the catalog, kind of mm -hmm. messy, still works. Or the modern way where you've got one single source of truth and all the variations are created at the time of delivery. Right, right. And there's pluses and negatives to both, right? One, you yeah. may want to crop it a very, very particular way that programmatically you can't. Yeah. The other one, you may say, look, just put a focus on this face here and crop around there and that takes care of it, right? So right. Gotta... Exactly. So I think there's somewhere, there's kind of a single source of truth somewhere in the middle where you may do right? some of the old legacy, you may do some of the new way of working in modern dam. To, to, to meet your specific use case for the type of imagery and or video that you might need to drive your, your business, but you're correct. Yeah. yeah. What about multi-language support? And if, if a company has, uh, let's say product A, and product A is represented differently in North America than it is in South America, yeah. let's just pretend, right? But you, but it's still product A, right? Um, mm -hmm. Can, can a, a dam support that where you go like, this is the image for North America, this is the image for South America? I would say as far as localization is concerned, and, and, and I think that's what we're talking about, right? Yeah, um, right. There aren't a lot of dams that do wonderfully with localization, right? Can you certainly create metadata fields in the database that may take a descriptive description or product name and allow you to have that in Spanish and French and German? And then can you kind of call or query that through API calls and have that populate for various sites based upon region? Sure. But it's it's primarily a little bit of a manual process, right? There are third-party tools and integrations that you can do that will help with integration. Uh, certainly, when we think about the e-com business, typically that localization piece is, is is at home and handled better in a PIM, right? Right. So right. You may keep the imagery and video that will support the, that retail initiative, and then you'll have all the variations that are within the PIM, and then that will kind of drive or connect with the e-com uh, system overall. Um, I will say localization is pretty good with third-party AI. Uh, but sometimes the translations, if you've ever used Google Translate, <laughs> you know the language it's translating to, it's not, it's not the best. quite ready. Right. Right? So, you know, uh, there are a lot of, of big brands that will have native language speakers actually go in and right. check every single piece of localized content um, because you just don't want it. You know, if you're in a region that's French speaking, you want things to look correct you know and be well and there's context right that sometimes the context. engine yeah. has no clue about that yeah. word may mean very differently in that image so I, I think the overall is there are some ways to automate yeah um, certainly in dam as far as localization is concerned at the end of the day even if you're using third-party integrations you will have to come back in and do some checking of that with the native speaker uh, in order to make it really uh, live up to expectations yeah yeah. Now, an interesting thing is we, we were talking about image transformation, which a lot of the, the dams now uh, will allow you to do. Um, with localization, sometimes in images you have text. So one important feature when people are looking for dams is to be able to to add text dynamically on top of the image. So you're not burning, because a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll burn the text inside the image. So now you have to create 10 versions, right? One for Spanish, one for French, one for English. But if you can just have the image and dynamically burn the text on top, can you explain that? What does that mean? How does that work? And do most uh, dams support that? Right. So I, I think the thing to think, the way to think about that is, is Photoshop, right? Or for example, Illustrator and Design. This idea that you can have layers, right? You can have an image layer, and you can have a text layer, and you have another text layer. Uh, and in lots of systems, you have the ability to kind of call dynamically individual layers, right? And if you know you've got two text or font layers, you can have the ability to call one or the other. So what happens typically is you'll create a layout. Let's say that we have a four by three banner, right? Something kind of like this. And you have text at the top and at the bottom. You've got text A, text B. Programmatically, you have the ability to kind of dynamically update that text. So let's let's step back. I've got this Photoshop document. I've got a text layer A, text layer B, and the image at the bottom. 
it sits in my dam. I have the ability at the time of delivery to change those text layers automatically based upon region, country, maybe I wanna change the color for holiday feeling, right? That's done at the time of delivery, just in time. And then it's delivered out and flattened as a JPEG or a, an optimized you know, uh, file based upon browser. Uh, but again, you're starting or you're housing that master asset, which is layered, and they're using the delivery intelligence at the time to automatically change that text on the fly. Again, versus having 80, 90, or 100 flat versions you create in Photoshop, put into the dam, and then deliver via different URLs. And more importantly, you I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you empowered, and I'm always about empowering the authors, you empower the authors to change the content on demand whenever they want to, without having to go back to the graphic designer and go, hey, can you create another version for Christmas and another version for Hanukkah or whatever, right? Exactly. Whatever the holiday may be. It empowers, but it also gives you that flexibility as a marketer or an e-com specialist or content operations team to be able to take that imagery and do different things with it that you wouldn't have been able to do before in a much easier way with, with, with much more intelligence. The second part of your question was, do, do all dams offer this? Not really. Um, this layering, some, some uh, dams call it templating. Um, templating is somewhat of a different kind of aspect of digital asset management. Templating for most dams means that you want to create a layout in InDesign, let's say, for example, a brochure. And you want to offer that brochure in the dam to a larger worldwide team. And you want to say, OK, they can only change the image, the main image on the page, and they can change the text and the price. So for example, let's say that we have a North American wing, which is English, right, and dollars. And we have a European wing, which is maybe Spanish and euros, right? We are making it available for them to come into that layout, which you've created in design, which is a really nice looking layout. And they can change, swap out the image for their region, and they can swap out the text in Spanish, and they can swap out the cost to their local currency, right? So that idea of offering those brochure templates or header templates, we can go into the dam in a WYSIWYG and, and change them. That's a different kind of templating that's creating either JPEGs or PDFs for brochures. It's quite big in the travel industry, right? That you might create a great eight by 10 or A4 multi-page layout in design, bring it into the dam, and then you wanna empower everyone around the world based upon the, the packages that they're creating for travel to kind of update them, but kind of keep the core branding that you've agreed upon for the parent company. That's templating. We're talking more about dynamic layering and that ability to make those changes on the fly during the time of delivery. And not many dams actually offer that functionality to make those changes in real time. Templating is a pretty kind of a common uh, feature in dam. So, uh, so the dynamic layering, we talked about text. Can, can you also do, uh, for example, in Cloudinary and other uh, dams like that, can you also do dynamic image layering? In other words, yeah. add, you know, merge multiple images together? Yeah. You can swap in and out logos, for example. You could swap out imagery as well yeah. uh, automatically through uh, the delivery and through the API calls. Absolutely. Yeah. I think an important concept to understand is when you're looking for a digital asset management system, traditionally people think I'm just going to store images or assets in there. That's it. Today, dams are a lot more than that, a lot more than that. So really start thinking of the possibilities, right? And at the end of the day, think, how do I empower my authors? And then what is the system that can help me empower my authors? And, you know, just let my designers focus on creating the cool you know, designs and not really I'm making a hundred crop versions. And I think you make a good point, right? When, when it's kind of like shopping for a car, right? You know, there are a lot of things you may have in mind. I've got a big family. I need a larger car, but in the future, I may not have such a large family. What, or I don't have a family now, but I have a bigger family in the future. Sometimes when people think about digital asset management, they only think of the now, oh goodness, we really need, to store everything and to find it. We, we, we're looking through folders all day, right? Which doesn't, mm -hmm. typically it's like with all software, think three to five years, where do you want to be? Mm -hmm. And that solution that you're going to purchase, does it have the kind of runway to get you to three years? 
into five years? Do they have a history of innovating in a way that will allow you to get excited about new abilities and grow into those features as your workflow changes, as your business changes, uh, as you become perhaps more digital savvy and want to do more? Will that dam support it? Because I will tell you, choosing a dam and thinking about all the workflow setups and metadata preparation and the file naming convention, and getting buy-in from various people in the organization as to how or, or what they need from a digital asset management solution, it's not an easy job, right? So you want to make sure that you do the homework and choose the right time. But oftentimes people forget about having that runway or, or a little bit of future proofing so they can grow into the dam over time. It's okay to start with, we really just need something to put all the assets in, like you said, but there are so much more that you can do with DAM that really will up-level your business overall. And sometimes people kind of forget to kind of, when they're auditioning DAMs, uh, to look at other features. Well, but I think it's really important to, to think of the future, but also to think of today and think outside the box, because at the end of the day, if you're just going to store images and that's all you're going to do, and this is my next question is, so what's the difference between a dam and just storing images in, let's say, in the media manager in a headless CMS, right? I mean, I can store images there. And that's why I think it's important to think outside the box as to, hey, can I empower my, my authors to, to layer this text in these images so I don't have to involve these people? What other functionality? So explain why should somebody choose a DAM versus, hey, look, my headless CMS already lets me store images. Why do I need to buy another system? I would say, well, it's a really good question. I get asked this all the time, right? This idea of, well, my CMS or my PIM solution or, or my homegrown solution has a media manager. Right. Use the term manager in quotes because you're not really managing. I call these media pickers, right? Think about the experience. <laughs> you're in your content editing tool, you know, whether it's WordPress, whether it's Contentful, Content Stack. You have a picture box or a video box. You bring up that palette. It's basically a picker, right? You search on a phrase, you navigate to a folder, and you've got all kinds of assets to choose from. You hope that you get the right one, you drag it into the box, you're kind of done, right? So you're you're doing what? You're picking. You're not really managing anything. You're right. You're picking, right? And I think that's fine to a certain extent. But but when you start to get into managing thousands of images or assets, when you think about trying to automate some of these pieces as well, uh, the media picker kind of falls short, right? Um, and also if you've got a marketing and a design team that that's working on the imagery they just don't want to dump it into a folder right they want to make sure and tag it with metadata to make sure that you uh, as part of the content operations team who's working in the PIM or the cms every day is getting the right images right can find the right image knows it's the correct version uh, and without a digital asset management solution with the robust metadata and workflows you're kind of in a certain way guessing uh, as to what you're going to put in here as well. The media manager also doesn't really optimize imagery or video, right? And it doesn't have this idea of dynamic sizing or editing. So as far as our DAM is concerned, there is a connection into lots of different CMS solutions. So you do get that asset picking ability, but it's more robust. You have the ability to search and find granularly and find exactly what you need to place into that experience. You also even have the ability to edit that image in the CMS as well. So if you need to size it for your header box or your footer or for your hero image on the home page, you can actually do that right within that CMS tool uh, using our media editing DAM widget. So those higher level features and functionality that DAM can provide, which would include delivery and optimization when you're ready to send that out for an experience, aren't really available in a media picker, right? So there's certainly nothing wrong with a media manager or picker, but it's very limited, I think, uh, as far as abilities uh, and, and right. kind, of, kind of optimizing that workflow for you as well. Um, right. 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 So let's talk about tagging and categorizing and intelligence search. And what I mean by that is um, show me all images that have a red car in it. Yeah. Now, does that mean I have to tag everything with a red car or can we use the image transformation API or does it use that API built in to automatically because, you know, you can do computer vision today. Right. And start identifying and tagging automatically. Do dams use that today? Yeah. 
some do, some don't. So, so some of the legacy dam players that have been, been around for a while are kind of slow to embrace AI and machine learning to some extent. Most dams now either homegrown or through a third, a third party plugin offer uh, AI powered tagging. That means that they will look at an image or a video upon upload and they will create basic tags, right? Shirt, hair, you know, uh, picture, you know, uh, plaid or check. They'll look at something and give you very general uh, specific keywords. There are some more advanced uh, solutions that will allow you to basically train uh, the tagging to recognize uh, brand specific keywords. Like if you've got certain plaids or specific colors that you want the AI to notice each time or logos, you can train it on a set of images or data, typically 20 to 25. And then- Or even specific people, right? I want all pictures of maps. Exactly, exactly. Or you can, you can have it recognize faces as well. Most of them don't do that, right? So you're getting basic keywords which is great for searching and it really saves you time overall because you're not manually keywording every asset. Before we had auto tagging uh, with AI, there was always someone in an organization or multiple people in an organization who had the fortunate or unfortunate job to go in and make sure every asset had keywords and metadata, right? And this was typically called the asset librarian or, or the database owner, and their job a lot of the time was to go in and manually tag assets. A lot of work, very, very painful. So now we have AI that does that first pass of standard keywords, kind of gets you where you need to be. But what we have found over time is that it only gets you so far. So it's a great example that you brought up, Marcella, which was, you know, I, I want to find a lady wearing a red dress. I want to be able to search on these natural language phrases, right? Well, show me a dog running or, or uh, you know, I want a Yorkshire Terrier uh, in the desert, right? You would never tag things like Yorkshire Terrier desert, typically not, right? Or, or lady with the red dress with brown hair. The way that we would search on Google typically doesn't work in town. Right. If you don't understand the metadata setup and the structure of the metadata schema in the dam, you're going to have to hunt and peck for things that you're looking for. And hopefully there's a good naming convention. But I will tell you, there are dams now that are kind of getting the idea and they understand how people want to work. We have a feature in our dam that's called natural language visual search. And basically what it does, it, it uses a neural network to look at millions of images and assets across the internet. And then when you upload images into our dam, we do the basic tagging, sure, but we also do an advanced level of tagging with, with our neural network that lives in a separate area. So that means even if you do no metadata tagging yourself, you can come into the database and do the natural language searching and you can find the, the lady with red hair on the beach or the dog running in the desert or show me blue skies on a cloudy day, right? You can use that natural language search and you can find everything that you need and look for and, and want for your project without understanding the metadata. And I think this is one of those things that we're talking about, which is empowerment, right? If you are an occasional user of, of the dam, or you're someone who drops by the brand portal and you have a selection of maybe a thousand assets, but you have no idea what you're looking for, you can search in natural language phrases and you can find it. Let's say that you're a graphic designer internally and you just want to discover assets in the database to kind of give you that inspiration to create content. Using natural language visual search to kind of search on phrases, really, really great. Um, and it also includes visual search too. So not only can you kind of start with lady with red hair on a beach and find those 30 or 40 images, you can also, oh, this is kind of more what I'm thinking, right click and do a visual search on it, right? So you're doing that natural language combined with visual search to find exactly what you want. So I think that answers your question. It does, totally. Yeah. And one thing you said, which I never thought about, but to uh, using a dam for visual inspiration, well, visually, I mean, we can store audio too, right? But let's just stick with, with images yeah. and video. But to use it for inspiration as you're building your content on your site or delivery channel, whatever it may be, 
I never thought of it that way, but that makes so much sense, right? It's almost like a Google search, like a Google image search that you're searching. Okay, what am I looking for? What do I need? But you're limiting it to the assets within your organization. Now, um, Max, we're going on uh, 40 minutes and I have 150 more questions for you. So um, I think I I think I'm going to put you on the spot here and you, you don't have to say yes, but I'd love to have you back for a part two. Sure. I don't have to. Okay, yeah. great. I got you. I got you recorded, so you can't back down, no, man. Okay. <laughs> I did this to Aaron. I'm getting and myself I, into. I know, but seriously, because there's so much more to still talk about, which we haven't. But unfortunately, we're pretty much getting to the end here. Um, so, I I want to end this one, and we, we're, in part two, we're going to get into a little bit more of the detail of the API transformation sure. and all that, which we really didn't get into the architecture. What do people need to know to even implement one? Well, so we'll cover all that in part two, but but let's let's end this conversation. Unfortunately, with um, it sounds like only big enterprises need digital asset management systems. So true or false, or you know. I would say it's false, right? If if you went back maybe 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I, I would say it was probably, it might be more true then. But certainly in the last several years, we've become even more and more digital, right? Um, as, as we've gone through COVID and the pandemic, people have become more and more engrossed in, in these kind of digital devices, right? Websites. And every business has kind of found out, hey, Either they started to kind of drive portions of their business with more digital and social, and they've seen benefits from that, or people still expect that. Everyone is very digital savvy these days. So that means you're managing a lot more assets. You need to kind of have your workflows together in order to capitalize on this piece. So I would say whether you're a two or three person business, right? Uh, whether you're a medium size or very small business, maybe you're a mid-market business that we use, you know, in, in, in a marketing term. Uh, all of these levels uh, require in this day and age some form of digital asset management. And, and I would say when you're, if you're thinking about digital asset management and you're struggling with kind of enterprise sync and share or just folder structure locally, there are tons of damn solutions out there that will fit where you are now. Again, make sure you've got a little bit of, of leeway and will be affordable for you to be able to work better with digital assets to move your business and workflows forward. So absolutely not. Any size of business needs some form of dam in order to be successful and to capitalize on this kind of visual economy and digital first mindset that we all have these days. Um, so that's my answer. Everyone needs dam. I, I mean, I, I agree with you. It doesn't matter. It, to me, it's the same thing with the headless CMS, right? It seems like headless CMS is targeting always enterprise, but even the small business, single source of truth of everything, content, mm -hmm. images, assets, audio, whatever, to me is so important. Uh, and we're going to get into that in part two. I mean, there's so much more. We didn't talk about workflows, permissions, uh, copyright protection. I mean, there's so much more that we need to there's talk about, which we will will on part two. Uh, Max. A pleasure, man. I, I had a lot of fun in this conversation. Seriously. Exactly. Yeah, I'm looking forward to doing it again. Yeah, definitely. Now, uh, if people want to get a hold of you, best place. I would say look me up on on LinkedIn. Um, feel free to reach out, say hello. I'm happy to connect there. Just you know, let me know that you saw the headless creator uh, content. <laughs> accept. Otherwise, it may be you know someone else trying to accept that I don't know that. I'm happy. I, I know a lot of people may have had questions, and I'm happy to, to answer those uh, offline for sure. I know on LinkedIn, you're under Maxwell, w, uh, Maxwell M, I think. That's yeah, how I'm Maxwell I, M on Maxwell M on LinkedIn. Yep, exactly. And you have short hair there, too. So <laughs> that picture shorter hair. So you, you don't. Yeah, yeah. But I recognize your face. So. <laughs> Max, it's been a pleasure, and I look forward to part two, man. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Yes. Yeah, See you soon. Definitely. Yep. All right, everybody, thank you so much uh, for attending uh, this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, you can get a hold of me right there, Marcelo at headlesscreator.com, and go get your account at headlesscreator.com. You'll have access to this uh, um, episode on demand in about an hour. Uh, and then stay tuned for part two uh, with Max again. It's going to be a really, really uh, fun interview. We'll continue the conversation will will dig in deeper into so much more about uh, digital asset management systems. So have a great rest of the week and until the next one. Cheers.